All right, let's open our Bibles this afternoon, please, to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 18. Today is just a few days, actually, after America celebrated its 247th July 4th Independence Day. I have a message that will not be popular among many professing patriotic Christians in America. It's not the kind of happy, feel-good message that warms the heart, nor is it a prosperity gospel message of the type that would draw large crowds to a megachurch, because it's based actually in sobering truths about America itself that most professing Christians in America have closed their ears and their minds to, but that they certainly need to wake up to. John says in Revelation 18 and verse 1, And after these things, meaning after, after John saw the harlotrous woman of Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon the Great there riding on that obnoxious seven-headed beast of a global empire. Finally then, John concludes in verse 18 of chapter 17, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Which woman, by the way, throughout the New Testament era, as it was in John's time, remained until the Protestant Reformation and has since regained power via proxy control of the American Empire. That city is Rome, the famous city of seven hills. So John says, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen. It has fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. John says in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Verse 11, And the merchants of the earth, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and of marble and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after I departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. 
But then verse 20, we read, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. It's been about 10 years now since I first presented a series of messages to the church expressing and supporting my belief that America as a nation is not only to be identified as a major player in last day's Bible prophecy, but that America has in fact become the entity described in this chapter. Being in the creation of Rome's Jesuit order and having been fully under Rome's control since the war between the states in the 1860s, and as it is also described as the daughter of Babylon in Jeremiah chapters 50 to 51, that we'll look at briefly today. We then formalized and posted that conclusion to YouTube in 2016 in our two-part video series, America the Babylon, Daughter of the Harlot. Many have joined with us in that conclusion, as that video has had over 173,000 views on YouTube since we posted it seven years ago. Of course, many have refused to accept this conclusion. In fact, see it as nonsense, especially preterist and post-millennial Christian national patriot types uh, who follow men like David Barton, and Chuck Baldwin, and NAR false prophets and those of that ilk, who prefer to believe that Bible prophecy is irrelevant to our time so that they can idolize America and promote the fictional legend that America's founders were all born-again Christians who supposedly established a Christian nation based on the Bible, they say. They prefer to believe that instead of the well-documented truth that most of them, our founding fathers, so-called, the founders of this nation, reject, most of them rejected Bible truth and were instead deists and Illuminist Freemasons, thereby being unwitting pawns, actually, of the superior general of the Vatican's Jesuit order, whose agents infiltrated their ruling powers on both sides of the Atlantic to foment America's war for independence from Britain. As deists and Freemasons, the greater share of America's so-called founding fathers actually served an agenda that they intentionally and symbolically portrayed on the so-called Great Seal of the United States, which we know since the days of FDR has also been printed on the back of every U.S. $1 bill. That Great Seal stands today as in-our-face evidence of the fact that those men were founding the nation that they believe would fulfill and usher in the plan of the ages, the hope of the Masons in building a new world order for the God of their lodge, who's named Lucifer, and who, while reluctantly incorporating a Bill of Rights into the U.S. Constitution, as was insisted upon by a minority led by Patrick Henry of Virginia, also included therein in the U.S. Constitution the seeds of that Bill of Rights actual undoing stating at Article 6 of the Constitution, this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, all treaties made or which shall be made, like the UN Treaty, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Simply stated, that most artfully worded clause makes the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights subject and subservient to foreign treaties. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding, they said. Binding the judges of every state to enforcing such foreign treaties in every state. 
the very type of UN treaties that today Bill Gates and his World Health Organization, in concert with the infamous and nefarious Rockefeller Foundation, are using in our day to trample the Bill of Rights to implement global fascism, COVID lockdowns, land use restrictions, water restrictions, climate change restrictions, hate speech restrictions, and the list goes on. So that clause in the U.S. Constitution also stands today as in our face evidence of the true motives of America's so-called founding fathers. On the other hand, some who do see America for what it has become and that have in the past agreed that America is the last days of Babylon and agree with us on that, are now questioning that conclusion due to the fact that Amer the American empire, as it is manifested primarily in the NATO alliance that emerged after World War II, appears to be weaker economically and militarily right now than it has been in decades. And so I actually I've pondered, pondered the question myself, which is why I'm bringing this message today. Is America still Babylon? America's proxy war against Russia launched in 2014 using Ukraine actually as cannon fodder and intended to weaken Russia appears to be actually turning out to be a complete failure that has in fact backfired. Ukraine's last gasp June counteroffensive is now dead in the water and groping another failure. Instead of being weakened, Russia's military is really stronger than ever. The broad economic sanctions imposed by the West against Russia have backfired and actually hurt America's historic allies in the EU far more than they've hurt Russia. Russia's military industry has ramped up to triple the production rate it was before its invasion was launched in February 22. The Russian military is much stronger now than it was then, with record numbers of Russian men now volunteering for service. They have two huge ground armies now, over a million men, ready to roll across Ukraine to the Polish border, unless Ukraine gets wise, tells Uncle Joe Biden to get lost, and agrees to stay neutral, not join NATO, and makes peace with Russia. Sadly, though, especially sadly for the Ukrainian people, Ukraine is a puppet state, and it can't do that. Washington won't allow it because Washington, D.C., obviously wants war with Russia, and they're using Ukraine to foment that war. Even while Russia's military is growing much stronger along with its economy, as more and more nations that have become disillusioned with the IMF and the American dollar system are joining BRICS and the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and are now doing business with Russia and China. The BRICS Economic Alliance is getting stronger. They're meeting actually in September to hash out a gold-backed currency. Iran has already joined the BRICS, and Saudi Arabia and Belarus are also set to join. Putin's popularity inside Russia is now stronger than ever, and actually among Asians and, and elsewhere, after uh, Prigozhin's failed coup attempt two weeks ago. Compare all that to what's happening in Ukraine in the West. Ukraine is a failed state with a failed military and a failed economy now. Zelensky is now hated by his own people and appears to be in panic mode, appear for his life. NATO is in trouble and has never been weaker. The EU has been more hurt by America's sanctions than has Russia. And its populations have had quite enough of America's proxy wars. France is in political turmoil, upheaval in Germany is close to it. And the White House, is led by a senile, incoherent, Jesuit racketeer named Joe Biden, who himself is on his last bumbling gasp as he tries to blither and babble his way through public speaking engagements. The American military itself has been weakened and wokened by the left's LGBT queer woke agenda. America's economy is in serious trouble with record high inflation, and as I have seen myself in recent weeks in the Tampa Bay area, Mortgage foreclosures are once again beginning to snowball as COVID-related foreclosure moratoriums have ended. Around the globe, including in Europe, anti-American sentiment is growing as more and more peoples and nations are sick and tired of American hegemony. They're sick of being bullied into submission by America. Of course, this has been greatly fueled by this staged proxy war in Ukraine that Joe Biden and company started via a staged coup back in 2014 now they keep saying they cannot let Russia win. We can't let them win. Well, the Ukrainian people are the victims here. 
The American empire is clearly in a state of decline. So the question I want to answer today is America still Babylon? Uh, the answer to that question is presuming the Lord Jesus is going to return sometime in the next decade or two. Yes, I believe America is Babylon still. I still believe that. I want to explain why I believe that the chapter we just read still and definitely describes America. But primarily, I, I still believe that for the same reasons that I drew the conclusion in the first place from the Bible and from history, not from the newspaper. First of all, we need to remember that appearances can be deceiving and it can be artfully used also to deceive the masses. The famed historical treatise, The Art of War, you all have heard of The Art of War, probably, purportedly or ostensibly authored by a Chinaman named Sun Tzu, and discovered, as the story goes, in 1782 by a Jesuit priest living in China named Joseph Amiot. That treatise advises that one of the first arts of war is to feign weakness when you are strong and to feign strength when you are weak. Tepper Saucy says in his book, Rulers of Evil, that the art of war was actually penned by Amiot's superior general, Lorenzo Ricci, who ruled the Jesuit order from 1758 until it was publicly disbanded by the Pope in 1773, while Ricci's trusted agent, Jesuit priest Adam Weishaupt, founded the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati as a front organization for the Jesuits. And as we detailed in part two of our video, America the Babylon, it was also Lorenzo Ricci, Superior General of Jesuit Order, who engineered and worked throughout the 1760s and 70s to foment the American War for Independence in order to accomplish two major goals after the papacy lost its control over the kings of Europe through the Protestant Reformation, and then the Jesuits had been banned from most European countries. Two goals. First of all, the goal was to break the power of the Vatican's arch enemy, the British monarchy and its empire. And secondly, to create a new nation that would champion religious liberty, ultimately so that Roman Catholics and Jesuit agents, whose first loyalty is to Rome, could hold public office infiltrating and taking over control of that nation. And to this day, the political machine of Washington, D.C., the Congress, the White House, and the Supreme Court is thoroughly dominated by Roman Catholics and Jesuit policy. Six to three majority of Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court. While the CIA is continually provided with new blood of graduates from the uh, Wall School of Foreign Service at Jesuit Georgetown University there in Washington, D.C. And so then in keeping with Lorenzo Ricci's Jesuit tactic of feigning weakness when you're strong, America does right now appear to be weak militarily. Military industrial production is said to be very slow, and it appears that, in fact, America and NATO in general is just about all out of armaments <laughs> that it can send to Ukraine. The last several shipments of tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, and Armored personnel carriers and associated uh, munitions have been far less than Zelensky was demanding. What was delivered has since been decimated in this latest campaign by Russia's impenetrable defenses, their minefields, and by Russia's precision missile strikes, which have really been perfected. Those defenses, of course, were built up over the past few months. And now, just this past July 7th, due to the shortage of arms available to send Ukraine, it was announced at a Pentagon news conference that Joe Biden is now resorting to sending Zelensky cluster bombs that have been condemned by the UN and banned in more than 120 countries after causing a large number of civilian deaths. The Pentagon says in effect that the U.S. fears of Russian success on the battlefield outweighs concerns that deliveries of cluster bombs to Ukraine can result in civilian deaths. An article published in RT News states as follows. Speaking to reporters, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Colin Call, Defender of the White House's decision to approve that another 800 million weapons package for Ukraine, including cluster munitions. When they detonate, the munitions release many small bomblets over a wide area. A percentage of bomblets fail to detonate on impact, however, and unexploded elements pose severe risk to civilians for years after the fighting ends. As for the Pentagon has assured its allies that the munitions will not cause excessive civilian harm, Call replied, I'm as concerned about the humanitarian circumstances as anybody but the worst thing for civilians in Ukraine is for Russia to win the war, which isn't true, by the way, not at all true. And it's so important that they don't, they say. 
He added that Kiev had promised not to use cluster munitions in civilian populated urban areas and to keep records of where the weapons are deployed to make future demining efforts easier. As if Zelensky, the Nazi, is going to keep that promise. In an interview with CNN's Fareed Zakaria, U.S. President Joe Biden described the decision to supply the controversial shells to Ukraine as difficult. He said that it was part, in part motivated by the fact that both Kiev and Washington recognize a deficit in ordinary ammunition. We don't have enough arms to send them. Adding that Ukraine needed cluster munitions to prevent Russia from stopping its ongoing counteroffensive. Russia already stopped its counteroffensive. It's done. Dead in the water. Commenting on the announcement, Anatoly Anatov, the Russian ambassador in the U.S., called the move a gesture of desperation, which it is. Adding that the West does not want to admit that Ukraine's counteroffensive is faltering. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesman Maria Zakharova reacted by posting a clip of former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki from the late February 2022 20, days after the start of the Ukraine conflict, saying that the use of cluster munitions could potentially be regarded as a war crime. So now Joe Biden is committing what his former press secretary called a war crime. NATO member Spain has come out vocally opposing Biden's decision, which was also criticized by Germany and the UK. But U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters on Friday that sending these weapons was necessary to bridge the gap uh, until Kiev's Western backers could increase production of conventional 155 millimeter shells. So we're out of munitions to send them, apparently, they're saying. Speaking to CNN later on Friday, Biden was more blunt. Quote, Biden said this, it was, very difficult to, it was a very difficult decision on my part, he said, claiming that he signed off on the supply because the Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. Well, obviously, so are we. So NATO is running out of munitions, send Ukraine. And the fact is that all of NATO, all of NATO combined, can't keep up with the ramped up Russian military production. America does indeed appear to be weak at this point militarily. At the same time, we see here in Revelation 18, that while this last day's Babylon did have its glory days, when it said, I sit as a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. In the end, we see that she does become weakened. Yep. And therefore we read, her plagues shall come in one day, yep. death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. The fact is that I never did really rely on America's military power, and I resolved that this chapter actually describes what America has now become. I also point out, by the way, back in 2014, that America was even then dismantling many of its land-based ICBMs and letting those that remain grow old while Russia was even then modernizing its nuclear arsenal. That was before Trump announced a, a nuclear missile modernization program, which I presume has continued under Biden. I'd also point out today that Trump also implemented what he dubbed the U.S. Space Force, and also that we have really no idea what type of advanced top secret weapons and weapon systems have been developed. What we do hear is that the technology that we are allowed to know about is decades behind what the American military actually possesses. All that aside, though, this chapter doesn't say anything about military power. That's back in chapter 13, may I say. Uh, what this chapter describes is a mercantile and economic superpower, which despite recent circumstances with slowing of the American industry and huge growth of China's economy, as reported by Investopedia just last September, America's GDP the gross domestic products surprisingly still surpasses that of China at a ratio of 23 to 17.7 .7 trillion dollars. On a per capita basis, America's GDP actually dwarfs that of China at a ratio of 69 to 12. And so on that basis, America is still able to spend more on military spending than China does. I think that we're obviously just not giving Ukraine what we probably could give it. But anyway, purchasing power is higher in China because goods and services are much cheaper. By 2028 or 29, China's nominal GDP is expected to surpass out of the U.S. And that, I believe, is why the powers that be keep harping about how China is America's biggest threat, even while Russia now, right now, has by far the strongest ground army and nuclear military force in the world. But in addition to all this, the main reasons that I still see America when I read this chapter is first, because of America's true history as a nation that was conceived and birthed by its true mother, the Roman Catholic harlot. It is unquestionably 
seen in chapter 17. As I've covered in several messages and in the aforementioned video series also, why it is that, uh, to me, while many try to do so, I believe it is utter folly, ignorance to attempt to conclude that the harlot described in Revelation 17.5 under the name Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, which John then says in verse 6, is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. It's, to me, foolish to try to imagine that this chapter can be descriptive or symbolic of anything other than that abominable, blasphemous, counterfeit Christian Roman Catholic religious system is headed by the papacy at the Vatican in Rome, which through the dark ages of its domination has the blood of millions of the true martyrs of Jesus on its hands, and whose false, works-based religious system of empty pagan rituals and incantations is really merely a false front to control its loyal subjects and also as cover for the power it wields both politically and economically, which it does through proxy control of the major central banks in the West. Keeping a mark in Revelation 18, turn back to Jeremiah chapter 50. Here again, I'm, gonna, I'm going back to the argument I set forth in part one of our video series on this topic. Another major reason I believe that America is the final Babylon, Revelation 18, is that we're told in Jeremiah 50, verse 12, that the Babylon being addressed by Jeremiah in this chapter, and continuing into chapter 51, which we'll see is also the same Babylon referred to by John, Revelation 18, must be a, not only a, a nation, this Babylon is not only a nation, but it's also a new nation. A last days or a latter times nation, referred to by Jeremiah as the daughter of Babylon. And by the way, America, I believe, is the only new nation that can fulfill the prophecy of this last days Babylon. First of all, as I've covered before, there are three evidences showing that the Babylon back here in Jeremiah 50 to 51 is the same Babylon spoken of in Revelation 18. And that John was actually referencing back to this chap these chapters. The first evidence is that both passages say all the nations have drunk of Babylon's wine, the wine of false religion. We read here in Jeremiah 51, verse 7. Jeremiah 51, verse 7. That Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Very similar language to Revelation 18. And they made all the earth drunken, and the nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. I believe this verse was referred to by John in Revelation 18, 3, where he said, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Secondly, in both passages, Revelation 18 and Jeremiah 51, God tells his people still living in Babylon to come out of her, to avoid sharing in her judgment. Jeremiah 51, verse 45. Jeremiah says, My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Then in another, I believe, clear reference back to this chapter, John writes in Revelation 18.4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. And the third evidence that Jeremiah 15.51, Revelation 18, refer to the same Babylon, is that in both passages we see similar depictions of a complete and a final destruction and judgment of the Babylon of view that never took place against or in ancient Babylon. Therefore, I believe Jeremiah 50 to 51 cannot be referring to ancient Babylon. Here we see in this, these chapters, Jeremiah 50 to 51, we see very similar language to what we read in Revelation 18 of a complete and final destructive judgment upon Babylon from which it never recovers. But while the prophet Jeremiah had much to say in his writings about ancient Babylon, and while there are allusions in this passage to ancient Babylon and to Nebuchadnezzar, the judgment described in this passage is not a judgment that was ever poured out against ancient Babylon. For example, look in verse 13. Because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. That never happened in ancient Babylon. Verse 15, Jeremiah 50. Shout against her round about. She hath given her hand, her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down. Verse 26. Come against her from the utmost border, open her storehouses, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. 
destroy her utterly. And then verse 40 we read, As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Many other verses like this that describe a total annihilation of this Babylon in view. And so these two chapters in Jeremiah, along with a parallel passage in Revelation 18, describe a total destruction that never happened in ancient Babylon and has never yet been fulfilled. We read in Daniel 5 that the Medo-Persian Empire conquered ancient Babylon in one night after Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belteshazzar, or Belshazzar, drank himself drunk using the golden vessels taken from the temple in Jerusalem. That night, Babylon was taken by the Medes and Persians with no battle, without a shot being fired, and with no damage whatsoever done to that city, almost the exact opposite of what we read here in Jeremiah 50 to 51. After the Persian conquest, the city of Babylon remained populated and even became Alexander the Great's capital for a time. And since we read in Ezra and Nehemiah both that only a small remnant of Jews returned to Judah with Zerubbabel, then at the time of Jesus, there were still more Jews living in Babylon than there were in Judea. Which is why, as we recently covered, Peter and Mark set up shop in Babylon to minister to the Jews there, from whence Peter wrote his first epistle. Historically, ancient Babylon remained a significant city until about 400 AD, when it began to dwindle down into what became a small village and finally disappeared in about 1400 AD, as the desert sands covered up the city until the 1800s. The point is that Jeremiah 1551 has never yet been fulfilled. Jeremiah is not referring in these two chapters to ancient Babylon. This is another Babylon. And this is, in fact, the last day's Babylon. And so, therefore, having, I believe, established with relative certainty that we see the same Babylon in view, Revelation 18 and Jeremiah 50 to 51. Now look at Jeremiah 50 and verse 12. Where we read, Your mother shall be sore confounded. Your mother shall be sore confounded. Babylon's mother, she that bare you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. First notice here in this verse that the Babylon in view is not just a city, it's also a nation. Jeremiah refers here to the hindermost of the nations, not the hindermost of the cities. And also, not only is this a nation in view, and not just a city, but it also, it's also the hindermost of the nations, meaning the last nation to come up among the other nations of the earth. Jeremiah 50, 12, Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. That word hindermost is translated from the Hebrew word akarith, which means the last or the end. That word occurs 61 times in the Old Testament. Always referring to last or end chronologically. Three times the word translated last is in the phrase last days. Eleven times is translated latter, as in the phrase latter days in Daniel 2.28. 2, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. That's that same word, latter. Too many times to count. That word is translated end, last end, or latter end, as in Proverbs 19, 20, hear counsel, receive instruction, that thou may be wise in thy latter end. That's what this word means. The Babylon in, in view here in Jeremiah 50 to 51, first of all, cannot be ancient Babylon, because this is this Babylon is the hindermost of the nations, the last of the nations to come up. It is the last day's Babylon, a new nation. I believe this also rules out other present day world powers, including Russia, and especially China, which is one of the oldest civilizations on earth. And so as stated, I do believe that Russia and China do have a part to play in last day's events. We see the involvement of the kings of the east, Revelation 8 and 16, crossing the Euphrates towards the west, at the sixth trump and the sixth vile judgment. We also see in Daniel chapter 11, the Antichrist who goes to war with his armies against those kings, and he crushes them just before he invades the Holy Land, and then he himself is crushed. I still do believe that we are watching the stage being set right now, actually, in Ukraine for that exact scenario to develop as Russia and China are joining forces to take America on. So now turn back to Revelation 18. There are other reasons that I still hold to this view. It's covered in our video. You might want to go watch. 
One being the way the international movement and the drive to create a global government via the UN has been and is being led, spearheaded and funded by America. Another factor I covered in the video is the abundant evidence of Rome's direction in the building of the city of Washington, D.C. with the associated fact that American institutions and national symbols are intentionally patterned after Egyptian Roman deities that then derive and descend from Babylonian Mystery religion. I don't have time to get into those issues today on that point. I would highly recommend you watch the video if you haven't already done so. Finally, one of the main reasons I continue to believe that America is in fact the last days Babylon seen in this chapter is the fact that, as I've stated many times, America at the present time is, without equal, the greatest force of evil, the greatest cause of warfare and loss of innocent life in the world, bar none. And again, while this fact is no more clearly demonstrated than in the overt agenda of the powers that rule this nation to foment open warfare with Russia, and what appears to be a, ref a refusal to allow peace to prevail in that now war-torn nation of Ukraine. The powers that rule this nation in America are fully responsible for that war and for what may well follow from it, which may well be nuclear war, that the insane rulers of this nation believe they can win. But this agenda of fomenting warfare did not start, of course, with Joe Biden. America has been the greatest force of evil in the world ever since the close of World War II, almost 80 years ago and even before that. Again, we're reading Revelation 18, beginning at verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, has fallen, has fallen, and has become, has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich for the abundance of her delicacies. America has corrupted the world with its pornography and its filth and its satanic music and all the garbage and the witchcraft and the pure evil produced by its entertainment industry in Hollywood. And then also in her devilish pride, America thinks she's invincible. Just as John describes her beginning in verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. I can make war with Russia. We can win a nuclear war. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. America indeed has been and still remains the mercantile and economic powerhouse that has dominated global trade and commerce. It has been the envy of the world, which is why we read in verse 9, the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Verse 13 mentioning those, all of those items that they can't buy anymore, cinnamon odors, ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and slaves, and souls of men. Speaking of slaves, I would point out that America was in fact built on the backs of African slaves from an illegal slave trade. It was an unbiblical form of slavery. And then after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was allegedly passed, ratified, that by its very wording, it actually made all U.S. citizens slaves of Washington, D.C., subject to Washington, when before they were state citizens, subject to state laws. So today we have a government in Washington, D.C. that has made the entire workforce its literal slaves by defrauding and coercing, and a lot of Christians don't want to hear this, but, but by defrauding and coercing all employees to waive their Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, file 1040 forms under penalty of perjury, incriminating themselves thereby, 
to pay an income tax that they are nowhere in the law made liable for. These are truths that you cannot preach in most churches. You will not hear in any other church because most Christians in America close their ears to these things. They don't want to hear this. But they need to open their ears and listen. I need to mention also that in addition to that form of organized slavery, due to the collapse of morality and the prevalence of evil and wickedness in this land, having now fallen and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird, the woke agenda is now actually suggesting the legalization of pedophilia. Presumably to take advantage of what is becoming fast becoming a more popular, lucrative crime market than illicit drug trade. That being child kidnapping and trafficking of children. The child trafficking business has become a multi-billion dollar per year industry because you can only sell a batch of drugs one time, but you can sell a child to pedophiles six times a day from the age of seven or eight until they're 14 or 15. At any given time, as of 2021 statistics from the International Labor Organization, there are more than 27 million people globally in forced labor, 6.3 million of which are forced into commercial sex slavery, child prostitution catering to pedophiles. 57% of, of human trafficking victims in 2021 federal prosecutions were minors. Many of the other 43% were minors when they were kidnapped and forced into that sex slave trade. And over 50% of all those that are taken in the world for this sex slave trade are literally shipped to America to be used as sex slaves and pornographic models for pedophile perverts. As John says, the Babylon I mentioned here conducts commerce in slaves and souls of men. There's much more I could say to lay out and decry America's evils I have in the past already, but for today, the main point of this message is to explain why, even as the American empire certainly appears to be in a state of serious decline, I still believe that the only nation currently existing on earth that can be seen to fulfill this prophecy is America. And so in closing, we read here in verse four, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Repeating, as stated in my message last month from 1 Peter chapter 1, titled, Come Out of Her and Be Separate, all about our calling to holiness. We hear the phrase today, America, love it or leave it, right? And again, that is ignorant hogwash. I'm not supposed to love the world, but I do have to live in it. I can't leave it. I certainly do not love this wicked as hell nation of America. That said, I have no plans at present to leave it geographically either. And at present, I don't necessarily, I don't believe the call to come out of her necessitates moving out geographically. Although I certainly would not disparage or criticize those who do so. This is where God planted me and gave me a ministry and this is where I'll stay until he says otherwise. But I certainly don't love America any more than I love this present world, nor am I foolish enough to think that there is any political solution via the ballot box that's going to change things that will ever change the totally evil agenda of Washington, D.C. And as made more clear in this message, I still do believe that Revelation 18 most certainly does apply to the fictitious entity that is called America. Of course, most of us are in no way able to financially at present to move out of America geographically. But as Christians, we must come out of her spiritually. We must come out and be separate. The same manner as we read in 2 Corinthians 6.15, where God says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. As Christians, I suggest that we must, in a sense, come out of Babylon politically. That is... We should consider ourselves as citizens of Christ's kingdom rather than citizens of what has become a very wicked nation. Amen. Paul said in Philippians 3.20, For our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, 
and verse 12 to 13, that we are to be giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And he says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We're his subjects. I don't call myself a U.S. citizen. Amen. Just so you know. Amen. We must consider the Lord Jesus to be our king in all respects. We are to consider his word as our law book. Yes. Our treasures are to be in heaven, not on the earth. Jesus said in John 16 and 17 that we are no longer of this world. His disciples, he said, are no more of this world than he is. We're not of this world anymore. We're not to love the world. Wherefore, as Peter said in 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Gird up the loins of your mind, be ye sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but instead fashion yourself according to holiness. That means, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, please show us what we are to do in this hour. As Just as Daniel was living in Babylon of his day, here we are as your people living in this wicked nation of Babylon today. Help us to know how we are to conduct ourselves uh, among this, this pagan people. Help us to be separate, to be holy because you are holy. Help us, Lord God, remember these things and to consider ourselves citizens of your kingdom, not of this wicked nation. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In 372, who is on the Lord's side?